As we have been studying 1 Peter, uh, one of the things that is evident is that Christians should be different from the world around us. For example, Peter said in chapter 2 and verse 11 that we should abstain from the passions of the flesh. We are naturally inclined to certain things, and we are told by Peter and, of course, Paul elsewhere, abstain from those passions. Don't give in to them, whereas the world around us would simply dive headfirst and headlong into all kinds of wickedness, obeying their bodily appetites and their desires. We should not do so. And as we abstain from the passions of the flesh, the difference between the Christian and the unbeliever is not that they sin, but we don't sin. That's not the difference. Uh, the difference is that there's a fight against sin in the Christian. There's, there's a struggle to abstain. There's a desire to abstain from the passions of the flesh. It, it should be clear that the power of the resurrection, the power of new life is at work in us to cause a new way of living. And this inward work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts becomes visible when we live it out in some of the relationships that Peter has been describing, our relationship to the magistrate, our relationship to our employers, our relationship to our spouses, wives to husbands and husbands to wives. It's in these relationships that people see our Christianity, where they see the life that God has given to us. Well, last week, we talked about repentance. One of the things that clearly distinguishes Christians from non-Christians is that we confess our sins rather than concealing them, that we humbly acknowledge them, we have remorse for them, and we, we desire and we strive not only to bring them to light, but then to live a new and opposite life, that is, with true repentance, repentance in deeds. When we repent of our sins, people see that difference. But you know, there's something that shines even brighter than repentance. There's something about Christians that should, if repentance shines like a flashlight, there's something else that should shine like a spotlight. If there's something that's as bright as the stars, there should be another thing that's as bright as the sun. What is that? And that is forgiveness. The grace of forgiveness. And that's what this sermon will focus on today. Last week, we looked at repentance, especially in the context of marriage, but repentance is only one half of the equation. Repentance, in, in fact, will go nowhere if it is not followed by or responded to by forgiveness. And when Christians forgive, this makes the gospel shine so brightly in our lives. It is a wonderful and beautiful picture for others to see. But this forgiveness, this bright light of forgiveness should not be some rare attainment of the Christian life. It should be common in all Christians. There are certain graces that God gives to us for a particular time. Sometimes people will see the, the grace of a dying saint and they think, I wish I could have the faith like them. But you don't need it. You're not in your dying moments and so the Lord doesn't give you dying grace. There, there are certain times and seasons in our life where the Lord enables us to pass through that season. And so we find certain special graces in the lives of those people at those times. But the grace of forgiveness should not be something that characterizes only certain Christians or at only certain times. Rather, forgiveness should be common, normal, usual, and regular. Why is that? Because forgiveness is the foundation of our faith. It's the foundation of why we are Christians in the first place. Every Christian's life depends on forgiveness and should therefore be defined by forgiveness. So by way of introduction, consider with me briefly the foundation of forgiveness, and then we will look at four points about forgiveness. So by way of introduction, consider the foundation of forgiveness. Last week, the sermon ended by saying that repentance should be vertical, that ultimately all sins are against God, and part of our repentance is bringing our sin to God and asking God to forgive us of our sins. That's where we need to pick up today. 
Christians, when we acknowledge our sin and confess it and bring it to God, we bring our sin to an infinitely and perfectly holy and just God. Sin, our sin, it's, it's a falling away from God. It's a falling away from an infinite good. It's a betrayal, it's disobedience, it's unbelief, it's treachery, rebellion, it's defiance. So when a wicked creature, such as you, such as me, brings their sin before an infinitely holy and just God, what happens? What happens is something beautiful, something marvelous, something wonderful. God forgives us our sins. But why would the infinitely holy and just God forgive us? Wouldn't it be unjust for God to forgive sinners freely? Well, he forgives us because we come to him, we bring our sins to him, not in ourselves, not by ourselves, but rather in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask God to accept the death of Jesus Christ in our place. We ask God to to accept the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ as being attributed to us. We ask God, do not look on our sins, but look on our Savior. Do not look on our rebellion, but look on our Redeemer. Do not look on our demerits, but look on His merits. Look on our Defender, we ask And the beauty is that God forgives us in Christ. He forgives us freely. Indeed, he has promised to forgive all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. And I want you to see that God has not only promised us forgiveness, he has covenanted us forgiveness or covenanted forgiveness to us. What's the difference between a promise and a covenant? A covenant strengthens. It formalizes a promise. A promise is I will do something, but a covenant is I will do something And may there be consequences and curses upon me. May the same be done to me and more also if I do not fulfill my word. Why does God make covenants or swear oaths to his people? It's to assure us and to reassure us that he intends to fulfill his word and that he will fulfill his word. He swears by himself. And so God has not only promised us forgiveness, brothers and sisters, God has covenanted forgiveness to us. It is his covenant with us. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we can read that, which is, of course, quoting from Jeremiah 31, but it's a little easier to find in Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verses 15 to 17. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds... I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. As Christians, therefore, when we go to God and ask him for forgiveness, we are asking him to do what he has already promised and covenanted to do. We go to him knowing he's already said, I will forgive you. We don't go to him wondering, will he forgive me? We go to him actually claiming forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ, demanding, in fact, in the right sense of the term, asking God to do what he has promised to do, asking God to fulfill his oaths to us in his covenant with us in Jesus Christ. This is why the writer in that same chapter says that we we have confidence and boldness to draw near to the throne of grace. Paul also says in Romans 5 that we have confidence with boldness to draw near unto God and say, oh Lord my God, please forgive my sins for Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake, in his name and by your covenant, forgive me, oh forgive me, I cry. And the Lord our God mercifully forgives us. And because of this, the Christian life is one of joy. The Christian life is one of peace in the conscience because we have a fountain 
that never fails. We have a spring that supplies an endless stream of healing blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. And in that precious blood, we wash ourselves and we praise God and we rejoice. And then what do we do? And then we freely forgive others as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus. Turn with me, if you will, please, to 1 John chapter 4. God's forgiveness is the foundation of our forgiveness towards others. And John makes this point in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The Apostle John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Notice that God's love took what form? It took the form of forgiving us, sending his son to be the propitiation, to be that atoning sacrifice that removes our guilt and our condemnation. And then John says, as you have seen God's love in the death of Jesus Christ, saving you from your sins and giving you forgiveness, so you must love one another. And so God's forgiveness to us in Christ Jesus becomes the model and the foundation for our forgiveness of one another. Now, we know, therefore, that we ought to forgive, that we have been commanded to forgive because we've been commanded to love and that we have been given a model and a motivation. We have seen the model in Christ Jesus and the motivation that that God has prepared us for this. We know God, and we uh, have been born of God. Well, how can we actually do it? How can we actually forgive? What does forgiveness truly look like? This is what brings us to the four points of the sermon. And you can preface each point with, you must be. That's an implied Uh, prefix to each point. Number one, willing to forgive freely. Willing to forgive freely. Remember that our specific application is going to be marriages, although these principles apply in general. So what does it mean to forgive freely? It means that Forgiving your spouse is a pre-commitment of your marriage. God's covenant with us is to forgive our sins. So we know because of his covenant with us that when we go to him in Christ, he will forgive us. He has already committed. He has already covenanted to forgive us. And so, therefore, also at the foundation of marriage is a covenant, a pre-commitment to forgive the other. I commit, I promise, I covenant to forgive you. And you you promise this freely. That's why it shines so brightly in the world, because people at this point nearly panic, saying, how can someone pre-commit and promise to forgive another person before you don't even know what they've done yet. Well, remember an important qualification, that forgiveness follows repentance. This sermon comes after the previous sermon. If there's no repentance, then forgiveness is obstructed and impeded. But having preached on repentance, I'm going to suppose that In this marriage relationship, the spouse has come to the other spouse confessing their sin and asking for forgiveness and striving to to live a new and opposite life with regard to that vice now practicing a virtue. So I'm going to suppose repentance as I proceed through this sermon. So being willing to forgive freely means that when your spouse repents to you, 
they don't have to persuade you to forgive them. You're, you have the, the flowers behind your back already. <laughs> you have the forgiveness just right there waiting for them. So that when they come to you and say, I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? You say, here, I had it already. I was already ready. I was already willing. I was already pre-committed and disposed to forgive you. It means they don't have to negotiate with you for forgiveness. It means you'll just forgive them freely. You're ready to give it when they ask. Your forgiveness is already there. They don't have to move you to forgiveness. You're already there. Ready and willing to forgive. Who would forgive like this? Who would forgive like this? Christians. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Look at verses 36 and following. It says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. There's a similar but different parable that Jesus tells of the unjust servant, a servant who is forgiven a small debt by his master, and then the servant goes and, or excuse me, who's forgiven a large debt by his master, and then the servant goes and and demands that another servant pay him a small debt and will not show any mercy. And Jesus says that you must forgive one another from the heart The one who was forgiven a small debt is then thrown into prison because he did not show mercy to others. Jesus teaches us that those who have received mercy and grace from God, those who have have been forgiven much, those who have received God's mercy and grace in Christ Jesus, what should we do and how should we live? We should forgive freely. How can anyone do this? Because we have been forgiven freely. But know this, that though forgiveness is free for the person whom you have forgiven, it's not free for you when you forgive. Forgiveness was free for us, but it cost Christ dearly. He suffered and he died. And so also, not in the same way, but in an analogous way, the one who forgives takes upon themselves the burden of choosing not to punish Choosing not to seek vengeance, choosing to deny yourself a selfish chance to control or hurt the other person. You take it upon yourself and say, I am not going to use this opportunity to ascend in power in the relationship. 
I'm not going to use this opportunity to control or manipulate or return harm and hurt on their head. I am choosing to withhold, to abstain from all such things and simply to freely forgive them. I'm not demanding repayment from them, in other words. I'm simply canceling their debt. Spouses commit to one another to do this. I will forgive you. Have you been forgiven much? Then love much. Have your debts been canceled by God? Then cancel others' debts. Do not hold out. Do not wait in order to increase their sorrow and make them hurt longer. We'll all wait until they're really sorry. They should suffer a bit longer until they really understand what they've done. If someone shows you a splinter in their skin and asks you to remove it, you don't push on it for a while before taking it out. And remember this well. Unforgiveness is a sin. That's the point, much the point, of the parable of the unjust servant and Jesus' parable to Simon the Pharisee just now about the two debts that were canceled. Unforgiveness is a sin. Holding out on forgiveness for your own selfish purposes is cruel, and it's wicked. Show me an unforgiving spouse, and I will show you someone who has never met Jesus Christ. Christian, be willing to forgive freely, but then I'll lose the power and control that I've gained over them. There's some people who will use a spouse's sin to control them the rest of their lives. That is wicked. It is cruel. It is wrong. It is sinful. When there is repentance, there must be forgiveness. The one who does not forgive feels a sense of self-righteous, not, perhaps not self-righteousness, but self-justification. I'm justified. They're the ones who sinned. How could I be sinning in this? They're the ones who did the wrong. But they have repented of their sin, and now you are the one perpetuating the problem because just as a lack of repentance um, obstructs re resolution because there cannot be forgiveness without repentance, so also if there is repentance but not forgiveness, now you are obstructing and preventing any and all resolution. And this person is now pouring all their water into sand. All their efforts are, are brought to naught. In fact, you are taking something good, their repentance, and twisting it into something evil as you control them and hurt them and keep them in a perpetual state of pain and suffering. Unforgiveness is a sin. Are you bitter and unforgiving? Then you need to repent of your own sin. Do not hold out on forgiveness. Christian, you must be willing to forgive freely. I will do it. I promise you, I commit to you, my spouse, I will forgive you freely as God has forgiven me freely in Christ Jesus. Secondly, willing to forget intentionally. Willing to forget intentionally. In order to forgive truly, you must be willing to forget. And this is a point that confuses many people because it seems like absurdity. It seems impossible. It seems like a commitment to do something that simply cannot be done. But the idea that it is impossible to forget the other's sin comes from a misunderstanding. When your spouse repents to you and you forgive them, you must be willing to forget. This does not mean a memory wipe. This does not mean a deletion of data. That's why it seems impossible. If you think that this means you actually remove it from your memories, how would you do that? I don't, that can't really be done in a sense. That's not what we're talking about. It is simply this. You commit not to dwell on it. You commit not to dwell on it. Will someone's past offenses or past sins come to your mind from time to time? Yes, they will. They, they don't disappear immediately or perhaps ever completely from your mind. But when that past sin repented of, when that past sin comes to your mind, the sin of the other, you must realize that you are now presented with a choice. 
Will you dwell on that past offense? You see, there are many who do precisely that, and they dwell on the past offense thinking they are justified in doing so because it's the other person's sin. They did what was wrong. I'm just recounting, I'm just remembering what they did. What wrong could there be in remembering someone else's past sins? But this is what bitterness is. Bitterness, when that comes back to mind, you need to commit to banish it and say, no, that was forgiven. That has no place here anymore. It's gone. It's in the past. It is done. It is repented of. It is forgiven. But the bitter person, when it comes back to mind, they dwell on it further. Yeah, they did that. Oh, I remember when they did that. I'm so upset that they did that. I'm still upset that they did that. You're just holding on to it. You're just drinking that. It's your favorite drink. Ooh, I love this bitter drink of unforgiveness as I, in self-justified reminiscence, dwell on the sins of my spouse. And it's his fault or it's her fault. They're the ones who did that. But if you truly forgive them, then you commit to forget intentionally. You need to understand that when someone's past sins repented of are brought to mind, this is actually a temptation for you. You are being tempted to sin. You must make a choice. You must be willing and committed not to dwell on it. You must be willing and committed to release it. You must be willing and committed to intentionally banish it and push it out of your mind. That takes effort. That takes exertion. And the the temptation that you are facing is that Satan is putting a knife or, or a weapon in front of you. That's the memory that comes back to mind. It's a weapon. How will you use it? What will you use it for? Satan wants you to take that knife and he wants you to stab your spouse again with their past sins. After all, they're the one who did it. Now you're the one who is sinning. Now you're the one who is harming, thinking all the time that you're justified in what you're doing, but they've repented of their sin. And all you've done is fall into a temptation of bitterness and unforgiveness. Rather, when you see the knife, you should just kick it away and say, no, that's done. That's the past. That's gone. Many spouses complain that they can't forget their spouse's past sins, but they're not trying How dare you tell me that I'm not trying? The point is not to act as though it never happened. It did. The point is to forgive them and be willing not to dwell on it or bring it up again. Because you keep blaming them. I keep remembering them and you're blaming them. When the fact is, by continuing to dwell on it, you should be blaming yourself at this point. It's now, this part of it is your fault. But people want the other person to be perpetually guilty. Proverbs 17, verse 9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. There cannot be true heart union and communion when a matter is repeated, 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 repeated. Okay, I'm not forgiven, but you're the one who did. You see how the the spouse who won't forgive is, is making the other person perpetually guilty when they're actually perpetuating their own guilt of unforgiveness and bitterness. William Waitley said, this quote is in your bulletin, a sin amended is after a sort annihilated. It is loss of time to stand casting on water when the fire is thoroughly quenched. What is reformed should be forgiven. What is forgiven should be forgotten. If they've repented, the fire has gone out. You don't keep throwing more and more water on it. You say, okay, stop, stop. The the fire's out. It's a waste of time. Brothers and sisters, are you holding on to the past sins of your spouse? Are you refusing to forget while convincing yourself that it is just to remember their faults? You see, give some people an inch and they'll take a mile, offend them just once, sin against them just once, and they will forever define you by that sin against them. Some hold it over your head. Let it not be so among Christians. Not for us. That's the way the world operates to control and manipulate others. 
If you are holding on to your spouse's past sins, refusing to forget them, then you are the sinner. You are bitter, hard, cold, cruel, merciless, and nothing like the Heavenly Father you claim to know and claim to love and claim to serve. And now you must repent of your bitterness and unforgiveness. If you cause your spouse to live in perpetual guilt because of your own bitterness and unforgiveness, then the proverb will be true of you and your case that we read in Proverbs 13, 12, that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. If they're always hoping one day she will forgive me, one day he will forgive me, but they just won't, that hope deferred, it makes the heart sick. It's just misery. If they have repented of their sin and they have been striving to live a life that is opposite, and if you still hold them in the prison of your own mercilessness, then do not be surprised if their heart is sick as their hope is deferred. Maybe one day she will let me out. Maybe one day he will release me. Brothers and sisters, let it be a year of jubilee in your marriage. Forgive freely and forget intentionally. Now, of course, a natural question is, does this mean we never speak of past sins? Well, no. When someone repeats their own sins, then they have, they have repeated or revived the sin. And in such cases where there's repeated sin, it can be very important to talk about patterns of behavior or to note that the repetition of sin aggravates the offense. So the commitment not to bring it up again is based on the person's repentance and not repeating of the offense. William Waitley also said, former faults may justly be alleged to aggravate the same offense reiterated or fallen into again. But if the one spouse does not repeat their sins in committing, the other shall deal exceedingly unjustly if they repeat it in reproving. So the commitment to forget intentionally is supposing that the other person is not repeating their sin. It is not wrong to address sin. It is actually loving to address sin. As the proverb says, faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So a faithful spouse confronts the sin of their spouse. They do not enable the sin of their spouse, but a faithful spouse forgives sins repented of and forgets sins repented of. A cruel spouse repeats them and refuses to release them, dooming their spouse and their marriage to a sick and twisted dungeon existence. Only you can release the prisoners. You must be willing to forget. And this step really proves, often proves, whether one has forgiven from the heart. The heart is the inward life of man. When the other sin comes to mind, when the other sin comes to heart, you must see this as a temptation into which you may fall into sin. A temptation which you must triumph over and conquer and say, no, I have forgiven them. And I choose to forget. And the fact is, the more you fight that sin, and the more you intentionally forget, then it truly does begin to fade from memory. Again, not a data deletion or a memory wipe like we do on computers. That's not possible. But the more you intentionally say, no, I choose not to make that a source of conflict. I choose not to repeat that in my marriage. I choose not to go back to that because it's been repented of. The more you do that, the more that thing becomes just something that happened in the past, and it's the past. It is gone. You must be willing to forgive freely. It is a pre-commitment. I will forgive you. And you must be willing to forget intentionally. Thirdly, willing to go forward. Willing to go forward. It is a beautiful thing to be forgiven by God. And it is also a beautiful thing to be forgiven by your spouse. What peace and what joy grow in a relationship of repentance and forgiveness. And after this repentance and forgiveness, we must be willing to go forward. What do I mean by this? Would you please turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. <clears throat> Nehemiah 
look at verses uh, 9 through 12, but a little bit of context. Remember that the kingdom of Judah, well, both the kingdoms of Israel and Judah were conquered and exiled. God had promised to restore a remnant of them, and God brought them back from exile, and they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, and they rebuilt the city walls, and they began to repopulate and dwell again in the city. And during this time, Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, and the Levites, the priests, they congregated the people, and they read the law to them. So this is the context, the the public reading of the law to the gathered assembly of the returned exiles in Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 to 12. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. When the people heard the law, the light of God's law cut them to the quick. They, they lamented their sin. They were sorry from the heart for all the ways that they had been traitorous and treacherous to their good and great and glorious God. But the Levites said, okay, the law has done its work. It, it has brought you to repentance. But now you need to move forward. The law is not to, to cause you the end. The purpose of the law is not to cause you to live in perpetual misery now, but rather that you might live in newness of life, that you might now have joy and happiness and peace. Well, so also in a marriage relationship and in any relationship, if there has been repentance and there has been forgiveness, what now? Now joy, now happiness, now peace. Wouldn't it be ludicrous for a surgery patient to insist on remaining in the operating room or even to remain in the hospital? The staff would say, please leave. (laughs) Go live your life. You've been healed. So also in the process of repentance, when forgiveness is granted, it's time to move on. If one's crimes have been forgiven and the doors to the prison have swung open, he would be mad who refused to leave. This applies to both offender and offended. The one who has offended, if they are forgiven, they should not live in a perpetual, but woe is me, woe is me, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and just always permanently sad for what they did. Yes, we, we will always live with a regret for our past sins. I wish I had never done that. But we don't live in a perpetual misery because we've been forgiven. And the same for the person who has forgiven They also need to, this is where he talked about, giving up bitterness, releasing, forgetting intentionally. They also move on. They don't make that person live in perpetual memory of what they did in the past. Both of them need to move forward in the wonderful peace of repentance and forgiveness and move on. Don't sit in gloom and despair when sunshine and hope are set before you. Don't be like Eeyore where everything is sunny around but he has a rain cloud over his head at all times. No, repentance and forgiveness takes that all away. For the one who has repented and the one who has forgiven, neither one should keep the marriage in a state of mourning and grief. No, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So many marriages, no doubt, think, I want to get to what you're describing. I want to experience what you're describing. It is not impossible. Repent of your sins. Forgive one another, and this is yours. It's just waiting for you. The sweet wine and the fat foods, the good things, the happiness of earthly life is yours to have if you will repent of your sins and forgive one another from the heart because of what God has done for you and in you. 
The joy of the Lord is your strength. Fourthly and lastly, willing to forego. Willing to forego. As you go forward, you need to be willing to forego. Okay, now you're confusing me. What does that mean? Well, to forego means to to refuse, to skip over, to not do. So what are we foregoing? What are we not doing? As you move forward in your marriage, will repentance and forgiveness lead to a perfect life afterwards? No, it won't. It will lead to improvement. It will lead to growth. It will lead, lead to peace and joy as you fight for this, as you strive and struggle for it. But you also need to forego a critical spirit, a suspicious spirit, a vindictive spirit, but rather be patient and merciful and trusting. When presented with the faults of others, do you actually aggravate and provoke them? Do you see the worst in others? Or do you forego the fullness of your wrath and forego the maximum criticalness that you could inflict And you instead help them to grow. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So this doesn't mean that we forego confrontation of sin. No, we should not accept or enable sin. But it means that we're willing to see the good in them. And we're willing to overlook their faults and their flaws and their imperfections. We need to forego the temptation to put your spouse under a, put their your spouse's faults under a magnifying glass. While each person is indeed guilty for their own sin, your critical spirit can actually aggravate and provoke and magnify the other person's sin. William Whateley said, <clears throat> "They are to be blamed as very unhelpful." that are ready to spy out each other's faults with an evil and malicious eye to make them worse and not better, that look out the faults of each other as enemies do the weak places of a city to make them weaker. Woe unto such husbands or wives. Sorry help is it that they afford to their married companions, and miserable helpers are they, and God shall one day reckon with them for having done so little good where he appointed them to do all good, and so much hurt where he appointed them to do no hurt at all. He adds, that happy effect of love, which consists in passing by wants and weaknesses, is exceeding necessary towards those of the household, most of all between the nearest couple of the household. Charity is in this sense a great cover fault. It will see none but where they be. Many it will see and not see and not speak of. It never proceeds to reproving but with a willing unwillingness. You see, being willing to forego means... Some spouses are just ready to jump on any and every imperfection they see in the other. And they're ready to, with a magnifying glass, look at every possible thing that's done wrong and is wrong in that person. You must forego such a spirit. You must forego that critical, suspicious, vindictive, and honestly self-righteous spirit. Charity is a great cover fault. Are we enabling sin or accepting sin? No, we are not. But as Waitley said, love will see none but where they be. A critical spirit will find sins where there is no sin, or imagine sin where there is no sin, or suspect sin where there is no sin. But rather, a loving, peaceful household, one of the things that reinforces it is a willingness to forego, a willingness to be patient, a willingness to hope all things and believe all things, and a willingness to help them grow in what is good as opposed to always and only seeing what is bad and and tearing them down for that. Love never proceeds to reproving but with a willing unwillingness. There are some people who delight in reproving the other. Waitley says, no, when we must reprove one another, it should be, I'm willing to do this, but I don't want to do it. You see the difference. Will you exact every penny Every ounce of your spouse's debts? Will you inventory their every imperfection down to every speck of dust? If you refuse to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things, then you refuse to love. And if you refuse to love, then you will refuse to forgive. 
And if you, if you refuse to forgive, then you will have nothing left but your favorite book entitled My Spouse's Faults. And you'll read in that book frequently, feeling self-justified. I remember when he did that. I remember when she did that. Oh, they're the worst. If you like to read from the book of your spouse's faults, repent. If that's your favorite book and you write in it every day, repent. And be willing to forego. Should I write that in my book? No, I'm the same way. I do those same things. I need to ask her for forgiveness for my faults. I need to ask him for forgiveness for my faults. What should I write in my book? Forgive it and close it. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In conclusion, we must be willing to forgive freely and to forget intentionally we must be willing to go forward and willing to forego. Because when we do this, the light of the gospel shines through us, a light that's not of this world. Where others would use another's faults as weapons against them, where others would try to control one through the other's faults, where others fall into the temptation of selfishness and bitterness, refusing to forgive, the Christian must say, the God whom I love the God whom I serve has gone before me and given me an example and a command. He has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He forgave me freely by taking the cost on himself. And he commanded me to love others in the same way. So when someone comes to me and asks for my forgiveness, I will give it to them freely. They do not need to compel me or convince me. They do not need to barter or bargain with me. They do not need to grovel or groan. They have but to ask, and forgiveness is theirs. I am willing, because my God's mercy is so great, because my God's grace is so great. This is how I will love. This is how I will forgive. I have been forgiven much, so I shall love much. And then we will enjoy peace, peace at last by the grace of God. To him be the glory. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you have given us the ultimate example, the perfect example. How we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How we thank you for your marvelous, wonderful, amazing grace. How we thank you for that fountain that is filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. O oh Lord, our God, what can we say other than thank you, thank you, and praised be your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask our prayers that we would not be hearers of this word only, that our conviction would not last a moment. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to put into practice these things, to at last put away the differences and the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the unresolved conflict the wickedness and the sin that has built up in our houses, in our lives, in our marriages. Oh Lord, help us to clean house. May it be a year of jubilee for us, releasing the prisoners, canceling the debts, letting all go free, freely released. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be like you and to love as you have loved us. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.